Hello, everyone. Uh, nice to nice to be with you. I am Professor Ahmed Uysal, director of Orsam Center, and we are following the Middle East for a long time. Uh, I am a sociologist myself, but I also yeah, I am interested in international relations and Turkish-Arab relations uh, and uh, Middle Eastern affairs. And uh, of course, you can uh, ask questions if you like uh, through the discussion panel and also on the chat uh, room uh, on, on the YouTube channel. So today we are going to discuss the, uh, the Turkish-Arab relations and what is uh, what is on the agenda, what is the historical background, and also maybe at the end I will talk about uh, the, the nature of uh, relations uh, today, uh, Turkey's policies vis-a-vis -vis, vis -vis the yeah, Middle Eastern crisis. So if you just... Uh, uh, look at the uh, historical background. Of, of course, Turks came from Central Asia and they, they were they becoming part of, uh, they normally, the Turks moved even before Islam and after Islam. But then when they became Muslim, they moved toward the West and they joined the Muslim uh, societies, Muslim armies, especially during the Abbasid era, they converted to Islam in, in big numbers, and it, it became a very uh, significant contact between the two sides. So Turks and Arabs are living together almost, I mean, more than a thousand years. And, uh, and uh, the region, the Muslim region, of course, uh, there is relations with the West. When Islam spread very quickly, spread toward the east to the Persian Empire, uh, toward the Persian Empire, also spread toward the west uh, to the Byzantium Empire. So both cases are uh, also relevant uh, with, uh, with Turks. And when the, when the Mongolians uh, even before the Crus uh, Mongolians, there was crusaders that uh, also attacked the Muslim territories. Turkish armies were very uh, also part of the, like uh, along with the Kurds, part of the resistance toward the West. But after uh, when the Mongolians, uh, Genghis Khan attacked uh, the Muslim empire and destroyed the Abbasid empire, again, the Turks were uh, important to resist these invasions and Turks became more uh, effective uh, with, with, when they established small countries uh, or uh, emirates uh, uh, with like Mamalik and other uh, uh, Ibn Tulun and other uh, different dynasties in the Arab world. So there's a huge uh, interaction between uh, the Turks and and Arabs. Uh, after, the, of course, the fall of Seljukis, when the uh, both uh, Mongolians they destroyed both uh, Seljukis as well as the Abbasid, uh, the remaining Abbasid uh, territories, the, there was an opportunity for the Ottomans to rise. In a way, the Mongolians formatted the, the territory where the Ottomans found a ch chance to reunite the. The Muslim territories, the Arabs and and Turks and Kurds and other nationalities. So uh, it was important. Uh, and uh, another role when after the conquest of uh, Istanbul, the the Turks. I mean, the Turkish dynasty. Of course, there wasn't much emphasis on the Turkishness during the Ottoman Empire as a Muslim empire that united around the name of Ottomans, uh, the dynasty, uh, there became a huge legitimacy for the Ottoman leadership in the Muslim world. And in similar, uh, similar uh, dates, similar uh, timing, uh, of course, there was kind of uh, a deterioration or 
kind of uh, losing the power of uh, Muslims in uh, in the West, especially in Andalusia, in the Iberian Peninsula, the Muslim uh, state there uh, was weakening, and in the same time, the Ottoman uh, Ottomans were rising on the east, east of Europe and west of Europe. In a way, was kind of uh, changing the balance. But with the conquest of Istanbul, of course, the Ottoman role in the region was consolidated, and the leadership is confirmed then we have then we have a, a interesting developments uh, coming on and of course with the fall of andalusia almost similar times in 19 uh, in 1492 the fall of andalusia also the, con the exploration of america uh, america it become it become uh, the Muslim territories in North Africa become under threat uh, by Western uh, superpowers, especially the Portuguese and Portugal and Spain. So Ottomans, uh, they had a role to, to kind of, uh, at least to stop the spread of uh, Western colonizers to the North, uh, North Africa. And they also helped uh, Muslims and even the Jews transferred from uh, the Inquisition courts, which is oppression by, uh, by Christian fanatics in Spain and Portuguese, uh, to the either Muslim uh, lands like Greece or uh, in uh, Muslim territories in North Africa, uh, including Morocco. So about 100, 500 years ago, the situation was similar uh, to the today's Middle East, where you have Western uh, interventions and domination or attempts to dominate the region. And also the Iranian, I will come to the Iranian point just a little bit later. Uh, and when, of course, and uh, the, the conquistador, where there's uh, both Christian and uh, imperialistic Western they call it explorations, but it was, of course, more than explorations. These conquistador or the uh, the conquerors in when to, uh, what they call themselves, they were uh, eager to to have three Gs. They were not only for exploration. They were not scouts team. I mean, they were serious conquer. Uh, con, I mean, uh, colonizers. They they have uh, they go after three G's, G's in English, gold, glory, God. So they were uh, after money, gold. They were after glory, power. They were also after religion. They were, uh, they, were they have also very uh, serious religious motivation that conquested, conquered almost uh, all of uh, Americas and Africa, and they even reached to, to other parts. So when they reached to, uh, the Arabian Gulf, when after they going to the uh, uh, South Africa, they with uh, technical capabilities, they learned from Muslims also in Andalusia and uh, Andalusia. They improved this and they had better arms, better technology. Uh, but uh, they, the Muslims also. Uh, did not uh, allow them to conquer more Muslim lands in uh, in North Africa with the help of Ottomans. That's that's for uh, that's uh, now uh, admitted by many independent uh, historians, Arab historians. They they say the Ottomans delayed the Western colonization in Arab territories for about at least like three hundred years in some areas, like five hundred years. So at the beginning of the 15, uh, 16th century, the year 15 and more, the Ottoman Sultan, Yavuz Sultan Selim, he, uh, he conquered most, almost all Arab territories and uh, adopted Caliphate. Caliphate also was the symbol of unity among Muslims. It was there before that there was an Abbasid Caliph um, present in Egypt, but he did not have any any power, 
with the Ottomans, the Caliphate as uniting power had uh, also the power and the legitimacy because he was able to unite all these uh, Arab territories, Meshrik al-Arabi, Umumen, in a very short time. And, and some other countries like uh, Libya and Algeria, especially Algeria, they uh, voluntarily, they volunteered to join the unity under the Ottoman, Ottoman umbrella and they were uh, admitted. And then after with the Barbaros, Hayreddin and others, they, the Ottomans were very influential in the Mediterranean Sea and in North Africa. They become very powerful. I mean, not all of the Ottoman territories were conquered by force. Some of the territories like Algeria, they joined voluntarily to the Ottoman uh, system. And one thing also as an example, the Ottoman uh, state was uh, even uh, helping in, I mean, it was more than the administrative territories uh, under the Ottoman system because they were helping the Indian subcontinent uh, to prevent the Portuguese invasion, uh, then Spain, and uh, even there was a uh, you know, big conflict with British invasion in, or colonization in the Indian subcontinent. So uh, Ottomans were helping Muslims outside their, their territories. They were also, one good example is when they helped uh, uh, Portuguese invasion uh, in, in Morocco, 1578, when they, uh, there was a huge fighting, huge war between the pro-Western, pro-Portuguese uh, dynasty and pro-Ottoman dynasty and uh, even the Portuguese King Sebastian, he, he came to help uh, his guy in, in Morocco and the Ottoman army that moved from, uh, from Algeria, they helped and they defeated his uh, pro-Western camp in, in Morocco uh, and established a I mean, stable government there and uh, it is an example that Ottomans did not rule Morocco, but they helped and protected Morocco until the maybe uh, to from the 1500 to the from the 16th century all the way to the 20th century. So it is a uh, it is a serious uh, service to the unity of or protection in a way of these uh, Arab territories, Muslim territories from Western colonization. So we know the relations between uh, Arabs and Turks in, in North Africa, many also uh, Janissaries that are Turkish soldiers that uh, came to Arab lands in North Africa, in Tunisia, in Libya, in Algeria, they, they were allowed to marry uh, Mary Arab Arab woman there, and they had also families, and they had a new generation of uh, mixed mixed breed, which is called Kulolu or Korolu. Arabs say say they also use it in plural terms. Uh, they say Karakle in in Arabic, but they were like uh, common uh, joint uh, descendants of these uh, mixing Turkish. Uh, and Arab, uh, and including, of course, Al Amazir, Al Barbar, they, they did not uh, distinguish the two. And with a good, uh, a good uh, leadership, good uh, neighborhood. So, in this time, the uh, both Turkish and uh, and Arabs, they they had a good contact, and we know. Uh, especially in Egypt and Meshrik al-Arabi, they say the Eastern Arab, uh, Arab territories, they had more intermixing and that's why we have, for example, in Egypt, a lot of Turkish words in, uh, in Egyptian dialect. Of course, we have more Arabic words in, in Turkish and in they talk about uh, like 10,000 Arab, uh, Arab, Arabic words uh, or even more. Uh, 
And uh, despite these are despite the fact that Ataturk and his uh, Kemalist tradition, they expelled uh, many Arabic words from the language, but still many words remained. Uh, and we, we see the other, other uh, side also, uh, some Turkish words in Arabic uh, accents like Dovri or Kopri or uh, Terzi and some other, other words. So in the 15, uh, 15, uh, 1500s, uh, the West was kind of Arab world was attacked by Western colonizers, especially uh, Portugal, Portugal and, and Spain. And in the East, there was a Safavite uh, Shia uh, state empire that also attacked the Arab world. And the, again, Yahweh Sultan Selim, he was, uh, he defeated the Safavids and he prevented the spread of Shia, uh, Shia sect in the Arab territories. And there was more than one fighting. For example, Kanuni Suleiman, he had to make two, two expedition to Baghdad to, to, to take it back from the Safavid because Baghdad was a critical uh, location for both countries. And in the way, uh, Ottomans also uh, saved the Arab world from the Persian and from the Shia uh, incursions in a way, a little bit similar to today's uh, intervention from one side, you have Western interventions in the Arab world and also especially America and uh, Israel. And on the other hand, you have an Iranian influence. And today, uh, I don't know if Turkey is uh, playing a similar role to, to work with the Arab people. But there is some similarities, of course. And uh, the thing we know about uh, the millet system, the Ottoman state was based on defining communities on, uh, based on religion. This is known as millet system that tolerated also the coexistence of many different faith systems, but it also, but it also allowed, you know, uh, the thing is not very much known is that uh, Ottomans also coexisted with other faiths like Shias and uh, other, uh, other groups. And especially in Iraq, in Lebanon, and even in Yemen, they had very good relations with the Shia, uh, Shia communities. And even when the British came to invade Iraq, the Shia ulema, uh, the scholars of Shia faith also sided with with the Ottomans, similar, uh, this, uh, similar situation with the Kurds and stuff. So the, the general story that we hear from some Turkish nationalists that Arabs betrayed, uh, betrayed the Turks is not very much true because most of the Arabs stayed with the, sided with the Ottoman state in almost all countries, except for Sheriff Hussein and some, uh, some uh, Arabian Bedouis that sided with the British. Uh, I, the historians say their presence was symbolically important, uh, not much effective on the ground. Why? Because their number was not very much and they were not a good soldiers. They did not have much effect on the ground, but it gave uh, the Western allies, especially Britain, he, he uh, they try to say that they are not fighting Islam. They are uh, fighting the Ottomans because the Ottomans were already also at the Caliphate. Yeah, so there was a big sympathy for the Ottoman cause from all, all Indian subcontinent and from the Arab countries. There was a lot of aid, yani, people giving their uh, gold and silver and all these. I mean, we had a lot of donations that uh, historical records show. And uh, the, to prevent this, there, there was some symbolic help with that they, I mean, they, the British would say, we are not fighting Islam because we are, there are some Muslims next to us or with us. So this was 
helping the propaganda a little bit, but their number and their power, their firepower, the military power, did not affect the, the conflict on the ground. Uh, so uh, most of the losses of territory, Arab uh, territories to the Western colonizers was not because of Arab rebellions against uh, Ottomans, but it was Western uh, taken by force. So they took, they invaded the territories by force and both Turks and uh, Arabs, they fought together to, to prevent this, this invasion. And we know, we see Algeria was invaded. Of course, before Algeria, Napoleon came to Egypt to invade Egypt and he stayed there a couple of years, but he was defeated. The same Napoleon, he, he caused afterwards, he caused a big, big headache for the Europeans. He always, he went all the way to, to Russia and caused a big headache for, for Europeans. Uh, but the same Napoleon was defeated in Egypt with, uh, uh, by the Turkish rule, by the Ottoman rule, let's say, is, uh, to be more exact, exact to Egyptians and uh, or Turkish and all the, all the armies. They defeated them. And, but after 30 years, they came back to invade Algeria. There was a change in military system in the Ottoman state. They exploited this uh, transition with the, because the, the Janissaries became more coup mentality. They were in, in I mean, the Janissary uh, military institution in, in uh, Istanbul. They liked to intervene a lot. So at one time, the Ottomans had to abolish, cancel these Janissaries and uh, build a new army but in this transition, of course, France used this as an opportunity to, uh, to invade Algeria. And similar rebellion happened in Egypt under Muhammad Ali, but later they, they agreed together that they gave kind of priority privilege to Muhammad Ali's uh, children to rule Egypt. So Egypt remained under the Ottoman rule uh, until the British came in 1882. 1881, French also invaded Tunisia, but in Algeria, the Ottomans, they, they resisted the French invasion. They tried to prevent them and they supported Emir Abdel Qadir and uh, Ahmed El Haj, Ahmed Bey, and uh, through Tunisia, but they couldn't get rid of France in Algeria uh, at that time. In 1881, uh, France also invaded Tunis, Tunisia. Uh, 82, British invaded Egypt, and Egypt was very significant for the uh, for the British because it connected. It was a shorter distance, shortcut to. Indian, uh, British Indian colonies, uh, colonization, British rule there and British interest in Indian uh, continent. So they invaded Egypt, then they decided to destroy Egypt. So this was a critical turning point. The British invasion of Egypt also was a signal of danger against the Ottoman Empire because they uh, so they uh, after the invasion of uh, Egypt uh, the British don't decide to do so they, uh, they decided to, uh, to fragment, to divide the, the empire and the Ottoman Empire, I mean. So they caused uh, uh, many frictions, many problems inside and they 
they decided uh, to support uh, divisive groups like Armenian uh, groups, and they supported Arab nationalism. They supported the Wahhabis again to against uh, the Ottoman Empire. So the invasion of uh, Egypt by Britain was a critical point to the disruption of uh, dismembering uh, or the division of the Ottoman territories. And uh, of course, this was concluded, of course, uh, during the First World War. So the First World War was kind of a fighting against the Ottoman state and the effort to divide uh, to divide the, the whole territories. And we know uh, British, uh, they had a big role in supporting Armenians. There is a good book in Arabic by Mustafa Kamil. Uh, Must, uh, he was uh, uh, the founder of uh, Arab nation, Egyptian nationalism. He's uh, uh, tackling all these issues, Armenian problem and stuff, and they uh, he, he worked uh, to emancipate or to liberate Egypt from the British rule. He only he sought help from France against British for Egyptian independence. He, he couldn't succeed, and then he he thought that uh, the only liberation or freedom is possible under the Ottoman umbrella. And he worked uh, with the Sultan, and he got even reward for for his activities and uh, and also very, very much, uh, he caused a big headache for the British uh, rule in Egypt. But his analysis about, uh, he warned Armenians uh, saying, you know, you lived with the Turks for a long time, don't listen to the colonizers, it, it can cause you a big problem. They call, it also warned Arabs that they, you don't rebel against Ottoman rule you live together for, uh, again, for a long time. And he said, you will regret. Just like 10 years ahead of the First World War and all the negative predictions, unfortunately, came through after the Second World War and Arab world is uh, divided uh, into pieces and again, still uh, suffering from these divisions for, for a long time. But uh, of course, the Ottomans uh, lost the war, but not because of Arab support for the British, but uh, I mean, all the Western powers united against Ottomans, including Russia during the First World War. But of course, Russia was in a bad situation. Uh, it, uh, it then, this, I mean, withdrew from uh, this alliance, but uh, also, uh, weakened the Ottoman Empire during the First World War. So Arab territories were uh, divided again by the colonizers. But one thing maybe should, uh, we, we should mention is the, is the, uh, is the, some of the development uh, investment, developmental investments, the Ottomans, uh, of course the Arab, Arab territories without oil was very arid were not very much cultivatable. And because of that, Arabs generally, when the population grow a little bit, they always migrated toward the, toward the north or toward the west. And we have, for example, even in Turkey, we have Arab tribes that come from Arabian Peninsula, but they also move toward the North Africa or even inside Africa under the sub-Saharan uh, routes. Uh, and uh, of course, uh, the, uh, the territory was, uh, I mean, Ottomans was trying to uh, bolster the trade and economy in the Arab territories. Uh, they, they did not distinguish between the Balkans and the Arab territories. Uh, it, the major big investment was, I think, uh, is the uh, railroad between Berlin and Baghdad that all, uh, all the way reached to Basra Basra uh, Gulf, we say, the, the sea. Also another uh, branch, it divided into two, it went all the way to Yemen. So uh, these railroads, they bring a big prosperity, they united, similar to today's Chinese Silk Road that they unite between the East and West. This uh, 
of course, uh, this, uh, this railroad united Europe to the east. So the ships come from India, for example, can dock in around Kuwait in Basra province and uh, then reach these goods to, to Berlin, to all the way to Germany, uh, Europe, and vice versa. But the similar route also goes uh, around, uh, around the Red Sea, around uh, Saudi Arabia, uh, went uh, to Mecca and Medina, and also a, a big boost for trade. Uh, of course, the Suez Canal was uh, one of the biggest investment. And after the invasion, of course, these colonizers, they stopped these railroads from, from use. I mean, even Arabs couldn't use it for themselves. It was a big investment, big boost for trade in Iraq, in Saudi Arabia, in Jordan. But because it is not used today, uh, it is, it's a big loss. And Saudi Arabia even did not invest in it. And even like between Mecca and Medina, they just built a railroad just three, two, three years ago. I mean, uh, huge, like maybe 100 million people are traveling between Mecca and Medina for Hajj and Umrah, and they, are not, uh, they did not invest in it until recently. So second uh, issue was the, a good sign, like a good example of the proximity between the Ottomans and the Shia communities is the Iraqi Shia tribes still using the Ottoman emblems, Ottoman flags, which you have red uh, background and above it is a white uh, crescent and star. So many uh, Iraq, Iraqi uh, tribes are still using the Ottoman flags as their tribal emblems. So they are proud of these uh, past. They are uh, also many. The one thing with the, uh, of course, the First World War was lost and the, the territories, the Arab territories were divided or, or that suffered most because the Turks, at least in Anatolia, they managed to liberate their territories. But uh, the Arab territories also, uh, the Turks or the Ottomans did not uh, give up on Arabs. Uh, and the, the decision, like uh, similar to Wa'ad Balfour or Balfour Declaration, which is not very much known also, there is a Misak Milli Declaration. This is and a response to the Balfour Declaration. It says, Misaka Milli is the means national oath, but this is like national Ottoman nation, Ottoman community in a way. The Ottoman parliament declared in uh, 1920. It says, as the, one of the last uh, decisions and resolutions in the Ottoman parliament, it says, the Arab territories that are invaded by, by the Western uh, colonizers, uh, it says the Arab uh, communities will decide their, their own destiny. So this is very important. It is even, they, it gives priority to, to Arab independence, Arab uh, freedom, because they are, uh, they consider them as brothers and sisters, over to retaking these territories. Even when Mustafa Kemal was asked about what we'll do with other territories, and he said their uh, emancipation from colonization is uh, more priority than to regain these co and control over these territories. So this is very significant and is not very much known. I have a kind of uh, an unorthodox uh, uh, perspective on the history because our history also was distorted by some Western intervention, also plus some uh, nationalist uh, readings, which doesn't reflect uh, the reality. But this is a major text, Misako Milli is there and it is even the first uh, sentence starts with the Arab, uh, Arab community's freedom. So see the priority given to the Ottoman uh, parliament, to the 
to the Arabs. But what happened was the Arab territories uh, remained under invasion for a long time. Turks were able to uh, liberate Anatolia and they established their own state, but Arabs couldn't do this. Uh, and after the Second World War, of course, uh, maybe there was a chance to unite, to reunite, maybe in a different format, not necessarily in the Ottoman format, uh, but the Turks, uh, the Kemalists, they turned toward their faces toward the West and they did not pay attention to the uh, liberation movements in the Arab territories and they neglected the Arab world mostly. Some of the neglect also was very costly for Turks, Turkey because when the Ottomans, uh, you know, they lost, uh, they, le they left many Turkish families strongly, I mean, uh, Turkish nationalists, Turkish origin people in these Arab territories. You can tell from the name, you know, uh, Shorbaji, Kashikchi, Kashikchi even maybe from these origin. And some of the, you know, you can tell from the names and some even you cannot tell. I mean, Turkish names uh, are Kahveji, Shorbaji, all Gs are in Turkish. Uh, if you have G, it means it is uh, it is related to business. If you have, for example, Izmirli or Tunusli or Shamli, it is a uh, nisbet. It's relation to the location. Li uh, is the location. G is for the uh, for the business, either producing it or kahveji, maybe producing kahve or uh, can maybe delivering uh, kahve or making. So these names even a good uh, good example, but the the remnants of the Ottoman uh, in I mean uh, population in the Arab world were neglected. They were very influential. They were some of them were were very educated, qadi or uh, alim or uh, scholar. I mean, uh, judge or businessman or uh, maybe even a statesman had a big, a big uh, capital, I mean, intellectual, social, and even financial capital maybe. But the Turks knew Turkey did not invest in them. They only focused in the West and they, these Turkish people who lived in Arab territories in the, of course, in a couple of generations, they become Arabized. They could have been like the dual nationals. They could have been a big, big uh, bridge between Turkey and Arabs. Of course, uh, we lost that advantage. And uh, still some people know, even I saw in Egypt, some families, old Turkish origin families still speak Turkish, but of course they, most of them are uh, lost, uh, lost the track. And uh, so these connection, except uh, maybe the Turkmen's in, because they are in big number in Iraq and uh, in Syria, they did not they did not assimilate it completely, but many of them were assimilated into the Arab nationalism under Abdul Nasser, under Ba'as regimes in Syria and in in Iraq. So to cut it short, we had a very interesting uh, relations and potential reflected by by these new. Uh, and we know that uh, similar uh, movements for independence uh, that, uh, were, that were taking place in Anatolia. At the same time, we see similar moves, movements in Palestine, in Iraq, in, in Egypt uh, for independence, but they were uh, not very successful because especially Arabs have oil and stuff. Uh, so the Western design, Western borders that divided the Arab territories remained uh, almost uh, more or less the same. And now you have 22 countries in the, in the Arab Lake. So it's uh, very much, uh, very much uh, weakened uh, and divided uh, position. Uh, of course, to, to fight these uh, Western intervention and colonization, direct and semi-direct or indirect. Yeah, I mean, in, in Algeria and in Palestine, the colonization was direct. 
But in other countries, it, uh, it was more indirect. And Abdul Nasser, he tried to unite Arabs with the uh, with, uh, nationalistic perspective. Of course, you have also Islamic groups like uh, Muslim Brotherhood. They wanted to unite uh, the similar territories under the Islamic uh, umbrella. And uh, I think the mistake Two, two problem with Abdul Nasser, he, uh, he wasted time. He could have uh, uh, make peace with Muslim Brotherhood and can, can be strong inside because he always uh, tried to fight with Israel and Western colonization. But internal struggle made Egypt, Egypt weak. weak when, but second problem with his popularity and his charisma, he could have turned Egypt into a democratic country, and he could remain on top of uh, Egypt as president, as leader for his life. I mean, he had this uh, credit, but he did not choose to, to, to turn to democracy. He even destroyed the other present democratic processes. And these nationalist process, of course, uh, without, without performing, without achieving anything, they weakened economically and then uh, militarily and then later on, of course, socially. Uh, so he could have worked with uh, society better, but instead he chose to uh, oppress Muslim Brotherhood and other oppos opposing groups. He weakened Egypt, I mean, at the end, he could have uh, made uh, normalization with them and did not waste maybe energy, but it is uh, his decision. We cannot do much. We cannot just interpret it. So what happened during the Abdul Nasser, when Abdul Nasser crashed the Muslim Brotherhood, the Muslim Brotherhood members, they were, they escaped to the Gulf countries mostly, where you had, uh, they were like still, uh, you know, rising from, poverty and maybe illiteracy. The Egyptian, mostly Muslim Brotherhood teachers and engineers, etc., they had a big role in helping the education system in the Gulf region also. That's why you have, in the Gulf, you have two major Islamic groups. One is the Salafis, or the other one is Muslim Brotherhood. And uh, Turkey, of course, they focused on the West for a long time, for like 50 years. And they did not uh, pay attention to, to the Arabs and they did not pay attention to the, uh, even their Turkish diaspora there or Turkish minorities there as a, as a bridge. And, uh, but when things get, uh, relations get uh, worse, uh, especially because of the Cyprus problem and oil embargo and the rise of oil prices, especially in the 60s and 70s, Turkey began to realize uh, an Arab world still has a big potential uh, for uh, trade and development and also with the political uh, alliances, you know, when they, they realize that if you have good relations, you can maybe pressure on, on them and we know Habib Bourguiba, he, in Tunis, he repeated the Kemalist model uh, and he also applied a huge, uh, very strict uh, secularist project. Uh, and uh, we know uh, Cyprus, uh, Turkey's intervention in Cyprus, uh, they made the Middle East more important. In during the Özal time, Turkut Özal, he was uh, maybe the uh, forerunner or the pioneer of the current Turkey. Uh, he, he changed from state-centered economy to a liberal economy. He, uh, he realized the importance of capital, capital accumulation uh, and energy sources and the market. So Turkey, of course, Turkey has good historical ties and he has relatives in the Middle East. Also, you, you, you realize that, you know, uh, regional alliances matter a lot. Uh, but 
uh, also economically, if you need energy, the Middle East has energy. If you need uh, uh, capital, the region has some capital investment. If you also, after you produce, if you need, need a market, also it is very close. Plus you have a potential for market uh, to sell the, the products. So uh, Ozal uh, was the one first realized this and he started uh, uh, construction contracts with Libya. Turkish construction companies are strong. They started with Libya in the 80s. A similar uh, also investment in tourism, uh, mostly started during the Özal period because he believed in the potential of private sector in Turkey and economic potential, production potential plus trade potential because Turkey also is located in a very critical, uh, very uh, critical juncture, east and west, north and south. So until now, the both were, okay. Uh, Mustafa Kamil, Mustafa Kamil. The, not Mustafa Kamal, Mustafa Kamil. The, the name of the book in Arabic is Al Mushkila Sharqiya. Al Mas'ala Sharqiya, sorry, or Eastern Problem. And uh, yes, Balfour was, uh, declaration was creating a national home for Jewish people, but in, in an Arab territory, so not in a no man's land. So these Arab territories also concerns Arabs and Arabs, uh, Arab uh, did not, uh, Arabs did, they did not ask Arabs, you know, can, can we join, can we buy some territories? They, they came by force with the British help and then now they become uh, strong, but with the also American help. So it is a rejection of colonization from anybody. Uh, so after the fall of uh, the Eastern Bloc, uh, the, the Turkey also uh, become more, Turkey generally sided with the Western Bloc and Arab world because they were, you know, against the Western colonization. Some Gulf countries, they were more close to America, but other countries like Egypt, Libya, Iraq, and others, they were close to the Eastern Bloc and Soviet Bloc. So after the fall of Soviet empire, just one second, my friends. So when, uh, sorry about that, when uh, Turkey became, uh, became more independent, uh, regardless of the Eastern Bloc and Western Bloc, then uh, they, the Arabs and uh, Turks uh, had a better opportunity to, to cooperate. But because uh, Turkey was struggling with the terror and also uh, political instability inside Turkey wasted uh, the 1990s uh, and military coup, etc. And the Arab world also did not have a chance to, to promote or to progress with democracy. But the relations were overall getting better in, these, uh, in this period. Touching upon opposition with all the background priorities, your view on having a communal political Islam and democracy second in the current world, Turkey is closer to EU. And Turkey is, uh, I mean, it's a unique uh, model. I will come to the questions. Turkey is, uh, has in a way unique mix of mixing Western ideals and principles. 
as well as uh, keeping the Islamic tradition. And I don't uh, accept uh, our buy-in to the uh, claiming Turkey is political Islam. Turkey is not a political Islam. Uh, Turkey is a, can be considered more like Christian Democrats, is, is more like the Muslim Democrats, uh, and is still under a more secular uh, rule, but is, uh, uh, is benefiting from these historical ties and normalization with uh, neighbors, with Arab neighbors, with history, with, uh, with even its own uh, society, with uh, Kurds and other uh, uh, richness in a way. We, we, Turkey is uh, making peace with them and uh, and this is the uh, this causing success instead of friction. So when we consider Egypt, for example, that fought with the uh, I mean, Muslim groups, either politicized or not, uh, is wasting a lot of energy and Turkey is not uh, wasting much energy on this. Of course, there are some uh, rebellions and issues, etc. Anyway, let's uh, like 10, uh, 10 minutes or so, let's focus on the Turkey's relation during the AK Party period. And it, the question also fits very well. During the AK Party period, Turkey democratized and developed economically and politically, uh, and also uh, open to the to the neighborhood to to the to the region so we we can call this in a way uh, both tahrir I, I call it in arabic tahrir wa tatbiya tahrir uh, of the tahrir which is the liberation of society and politics and economy all, uh, which uh, i mean many some countries uh, some people think, uh, I also talk to the Arab, uh, Arabs a lot, they think Erdogan is doing everything or AK Party is doing everything or the government. It is not true. The, uh, the success comes from enabling society, giving them power, giving them the opportunity. So society uh, serve itself. So one side is liberation, one side is normalization. So if you normalize and you don't see one part of uh, society as a threat, as a danger, uh, then uh, you can save energy and you can uh, progress, which is what happened in, in Turkey in the area of, of course, uh, the government tried to solve economic problem, but they also gives a big room for uh, private enterprise. Uh, similar in the education sector, of course, government is trying to improve education, but with the help of uh, private sector also for profit or for hire, for uh, religious maybe uh, uh, incentives, motivations. Uh, this will lower the burden of uh, government. So, so education sector is improving. Similar in health sector, you know, of course there are hospitals and there are good services in uh, Turkish hospitals, but it also allows private enterprise or even uh, charity mentality health, uh, uh, health services. So they uh, all serve the, to the well-being of uh, society. So the opening to the Arab world is also part of this normalization uh, of Turkey with the neighborhood, with the identity, with historical identity, with the Ottoman past, with the Arabs, and etc. It it provided uh, a big uh, success for uh, for uh, uh, for Turkish society. So, uh, in this period, also Turkey pay attention to the Arab world for investment, for market, for also uh, cooperation and. Uh, sees, uh, especially after the, uh, the eruption of Arab Spring, Turkey not try to promote democracy, but when people uh, rebelled or the people protested in big numbers against this oppressive government, Turkey sided with, uh, with democracy rather than siding with like this party or this political Islam they they are saying, I, I don't think it is true. Uh, I mean, they, Turkey sided with uh, 
uh, with democracy in Egypt, not necessarily with the Muslim Brotherhood. Of course, Muslim Brotherhood is oppressed and Turkey, Tur Turkey is uh, uh, providing uh, them shelter, but bizim teknik abi şeyde soruları açmamışsınız YouTube YouTube'da sohbet kısmını açın isterseniz soru sorabilsin arkadaşlar buradan seyircilerimiz e, gerçi tamam çok sıkıntı değil hocam şey açık ama YouTube çek açık normalde tamam sorun değil o zaman aynen okay so uh... We also with some other arkadaşlar var. So we, uh, we when the Arabs uh, decided to have democracy, of course Turkey morally uh, sided with the with democratic demands of uh, Arab people, because uh, Turkey developed with the democracy. There is a uh, interesting connection between democracy and development, between democracy and independence. So the weak regimes are dependent on the West uh, or even the East doesn't matter as much. Like if you are weak inside, you need a foreign support, support of America or Israel or, or Russian. If you are strong inside, you don't need to give concession to big powers, big interests. So you can uh, make yourself stronger. So this is the dilemma. So when Turkey, also suffered from uh, multiple coups, military interventions in, in the past. So Turkey was very conscious and you, you know Turkish people also uh, and resisted by bare hands. And I was also part of it when the Gulenists, they tried to take over the, uh, over the power. Uh, and I even took uh, with my family, I mean, to, to the state. And but the Arabs, uh, you know, like Egypt, they, they the military ruled the country from behind, and they didn't notice the danger. Now they know after the coup, of course, it's after it's too late. But in some countries like uh, Syria, the people did not even given a chance, even though they toppled the Assad regime maybe even more than once. You know, they were the uh, Assad regime was falling. Hezbollah came to help uh, the regime and it wasn't enough. Then Iranians came to help. Then uh, ISIS came to help uh, the regime. ISIS, as you know, uh, toppled the opposition rather than toppling the, uh, the Assad regime. Then it wasn't enough. Then the Russians came uh, to suppress the Arab democratic demands in Syria. But overall we see Democratic uh, uh, system is more stable, uh, more uh, prosperous, uh, more developed, and more independent. So, uh, as Turkey benefit from this model, and the Turkey also naturally ex hopes that uh, this works for for other countries. But of course, it is the native people struggle more or less than. Turkey's uh, struggle, you know, uh, if Syrians, they, they pay the big price, of course, but uh, I mean, if it's the, the same for Yemen, for Egypt and for Libya, Turkey, for example, in Libya, maybe just mention like a couple of examples and then we take questions. In Syria, Turkey supported the opposition and democratic uh, demands, still supporting them, but uh, Obama and other uh, big powers, they, uh, they neglected or even bought, sold out uh, the Arab demands uh, in, uh, in Syria. He said red line and uh, chemical weapons use. He, Obama didn't do anything. Of course, after that, Trump did not do anything. And Turkey is trying to support at least the northern part. There is an American plan to divide uh, divide Syria with the PKK state, not the Kurdish state, PKK state, and uh, Turkey is resisting that also. 
uh, with uh, also trying to stabilize these regions, try to improve these areas with uh, financial support and also transferring some of their expertise and education in, in health sector, in economy to these Turkey controlled areas, but Turkey is not controlling them 100%. Turkey is providing the uh, major uh, umbrella, but the Syrians uh, trying to learn how to rule themselves with local government, etc., in the Turkish controlled areas in north of uh, Syria. But uh, we know east of Euphrates River, the PKK, PYD, Allied forces invade these fertile grounds and also there is oil there. America is helping them to control oil and uh, other parts also Assad regime is controlling. So Turkey is for the unity of Syria and democratic Syria. Turkey supports the opposition and democratic constitution. There is a UN sponsored or UN supervised project of uh, writing a new constitution and maybe foreseeing elections, but Assad regime is trying to delay this as much as possible and they want to remain as it is. No, they don't want any change. But Syrian people want change and many Syrians live outside. They want to go back to their home. They will not go back until Syria is stabilized. So if we focus on Iraq, also similar things, uh, uh, similar principles at work in, in Iraq, but Iraq is more diverse, have uh, Arabs, divided uh, as Shia and Sunni. Uh, we have Kurds, we have Turkmens in, in Iraq. Turkey try to have balanced relation between all sides, among all sides, and have no problem with Shia, uh, Shia majority, but uh, Iran trying to control its Shia majority in, in Iraq with the militias and with also political pressure with some political parties also allied with Iran but it is also causing reaction and uh, criticism from even inside uh, the Shia communities. Last year, there was a big protest in, even before last year, big protest in Iraq that toppled the government and uh, Turkey promised $5 billion to, to help uh, credits and uh, donations to help the Iraqi government uh, to stabilize and to reconstruction of uh, Iraq. And with the Gulf region, uh, we had normal relations with, uh, with the Gulf, but when Arab Spring happened, especially the Saudi Arabia and United Arab Emirates and Bahrain, they were afraid of their, uh, the future of their regimes, I think more than necessary. I don't see why they, they were so worried about democracy in the Arab world, but they uh, or they were organized against democratic movements in Egypt, in Libya, in, uh, in Yemen, for example. They, they, they helped to, to, to the creation of a mess in, in the Arab world, but uh, Turkey uh, chose to, uh, to stabilize more, more than uh, more than uh, maybe understood today. So in Iraq, there is a political process going on. And on the, on the one side, there are protests and young generation are fed up with lack of services, electricity, shortage of water and uh, other issue, unemployment and health issues, et cetera. And as you know, Iraq is full of oil. You know, they produce a lot of oil, but it is, it is uh, corruption that cause uh, big uh, problems. So in Yemen, for example, we, we supported the same, but the Gulf countries, uh, even though Yemeni started very well to build their dialogue and they, they had a good regime, but uh, Iranian and uh, Saudi struggle there allowed the Houthi coup. They were both worried about democratic process. Now uh, they end up uh, fighting together. I think there was a plan with Obama to make Turkey and Iran fight in, in Syria uh, to destroy both countries. But uh, Turkey did not dive into this. Uh, but in, in Yemen, Saudi Arabia and Iran 
they enter the war that is very destructive for all of them, and Iran and Saudi Arabia, plus for the Yemenis. They are suffering a lot. Turkey is trying to help Yemen, not, I mean, politically, diplomatically, but also with uh, humanitarian aid, etc. And Yemen is a, is a mess right now. In Libya, Turkey, of course, uh, they try to repeat uh, the, the coup example, coup project in, in Egypt. They want to repeat it in Libya. But Libyans re refused this coup project, especially on the uh, western part of the, which is more populated, uh, Trablus and uh, Misrata and other areas in the west. So they rejected the uh, Haftar and the coup attempt. So there was a stalemate, so a kind of no, no side can take an upper hand. So uh, after uh, you know two years, uh, Turkey they they requested help from Turkey, and Turkey helped the Democratic International recognize uh, side in in Trablus and succeeded in that. So Turkey is a stabilizing force. Turkey also support the dialogue and political solution in Libya. Uh, Turkey also provided the, I mean, military support is known, but a huge diplomatic support for the Sarraj government, which is an accord government, Rifaq. I mean, they already was a uh, agreement government. In the end, uh, they, it, uh, it is, uh, I mean, it's not uh, over, but uh, it is now up to the Libyans now to decide and to unite their country. But unfortunately, I don't see a, a, a strong unity among uh, Libyans because there is, uh, they call it Jihawiya. They, they, they have East and West and uh, desert uh, side. So they focus too much on their uh, localities. It's a problem, there is tribalism. There is also international intervention in, in, in Libya, hurting the country a lot. But of course, we, we want uh, Libya to prosper and to be stable. And they also have all the necessary resources to, to make. I mean, it's a huge country with few population, 6 million population. The, the territory is more than Egypt. Uh, and huge, they have oil and gas and gold and other things. These also resources attract maybe foreign intervention. But uh, at the end, uh, Turkey did not allow them uh, or allow the coup happen in, in Libya, which is maybe considered a, su a success. In other uh, North African countries like uh, Algeria, Morocco and Tunis, Tunis was the cradle of Arab democracies, and it is succeeding uh, democratically, but have economic problems because it is a small country, have less resources, plus a lot of intervention in Tunisia, especially uh, French intervention and some Gulf intervention. They try to depict Turkey as uh, siding like an Nahda and Brotherhood, and this is not uh, particularly true. Turkey has good relations for with everybody. For example, uh, the uh, the previous the former uh, president and his rule uh, Sipsi was a secular man, but Turkey had good relations. I mean, sometimes you you hear a propaganda that Turkey only works with Islamists. This is not true. Uh, Turkey works uh, with all uh, democratic and uh, legitimate governments. So Tunisia is, uh, is a good example. Algeria has, Turkey has good relations with Algeria uh, historically also, but Algeria is uh, too much under the, especially French uh, intervention there. They, on the one hand, they want democracy. On the one hand, they want full independence. There is a struggle inside Algeria between the, the two sides, but uh, people also get tired and they want more uh, services, more development, uh, less un unemployment, etc. So Algeria also has a very good potential for development. 
uh, and Turkey also has good relations with Algeria, similar to, to Morocco. Uh, Morocco chose a reformist line of development rather than revolution. So political parties in, in Morocco, they, they agreed with the, with the king there uh, over the political process and the political process is going on, even though it is slow, but, uh, you know, uh, of course, uh, relations are, uh, are good with Morocco and, uh, but of course, uh, these countries, all, almost all of them are suffering from the impact of uh, Corona with uh, less revenues, especially Morocco and Tunisia are dependent on tourism. When tourism was interrupted, they, they suffer from uh, the lack of revenues and it's a big uh, issue now. Uh, but uh, we are working with Algeria and Morocco and Tunisia to solve, uh, to solve the Libyan uh, crisis because they are also affected by the Libyan, Libyan crisis and Libyan instability. So this is uh, the overall story in the Middle East. If you have more questions, you can ask me. And uh, we want to try to answer. Şey açabilirsin istiyorsan mikrofonları da yani açabilirsin sıkıntı değil. If you want to if you if you want to ask by voice also you can no problem. Yes, if you want to ask question by voice also, go ahead. I, I use this time in, in Orsam, we also have other programs, uh, training programs and panels in Arabic, in English and in Turkish. You can also uh, follow them and we will publish one magazine on daily Middle Eastern affairs in, in Arabic <laughs> We are gonna have an Arabic magazine on current uh, Middle Eastern affairs. We will have, uh, you know, other activities. We have now Istanbul branch also very active. So we can, you can join these activities. So if you wanna ask by, by voice or uh, by writing, both are fine. Looks like uh, people who like to listen, uh, which is okay. If I If I continue, maybe five minutes, and then we'll uh, we can close it. Uh, of course, the the PKK issue is very very much uh, asked. Turkey is not fighting the Kurds. Turkey has the bigger biggest number of Kurds, and especially the half of the Kurds are voting for the current uh, AK Party government, and the the other half is. Uh, voting for more ethnic line. So uh, uh, Turkey also has uh, like, uh, they have a region in Iraq is called uh, uh, Kurdistan regional government. Maybe in Istanbul, there are as many Kurds as, as in this region. But in Turkey, we have of course, uh, a lot more than Kurdistan region. So uh, sometimes they, pretend to be the representative of Kurds, but Turkey has more Kurds than other countries. So Kurdish, when you talk about Kurds, the Kurds in Turkey are more, uh, have, more have more to say because they are in uh, bigger numbers. Secondly, there is a, there is a debate about 
there is a debate about uh, the Gulenists. They are also active in the Arab world. They are uh, trying to hurt the relations between between Turkey and the Arab world. They always now they have websites that uh, curse uh, Turkey and even the history. Unfortunately, I mean, these are like Turkish people, but uh, with political gain, they are using all the means to use against the Turkish uh, state and Turkish government. Uh, what happened was they, they are like, they were a religious group. Uh, they said they are like civil society and they, they work fine with the current government, but they also work fine with other governments. But uh, all of a sudden, they, they want to take power in their hands, the whole power. Uh, and while they were saying that they are not political, they are not uh, involved in politics, then they want to control the power without any election, without any legitimacy. So, I mean, of, if you want to hold power, you can join a establish a political party and then you join the election and if people give you the power you take the power but they chose to do it with their members hidden in the military and in other institutions of course they work like 40 years saying that we are above politics but they realized they were for politics for power of course in the name of uh, big powers. They are their leader in, in living in America and uh, directing them from outside. And they have a Arabic propaganda also that's affecting our uh, maybe perception a little bit with the Arabs, but uh, Arab public opinion also uh, knows that uh, there are, uh, you know, Turkey is criticized for not listening to the to the impositions. If they listen to what uh, big powers say, like Egypt or others, you know, they said, oh, this is a very good guy or something like that. So when you resist, you, you become a target. When you are strong, you become a target. This is kind of natural, but at least we should see the, uh, the real picture. It's not, I mean, uh, sometime in the West, they criticize Turkey not being democratic, but they, uh, you know, they welcome uh, very authoritarian leaders in, in the White House and they uh, praise them and they said, this is my favorite dictator and stuff. So they have, uh, the West has a double standard on, uh, on democracy. They, they say they like democracy, but they don't really support democracy when it doesn't fit to their interest. And as I said, there is a relation between democracy and independence. So the big powers who want Turkey to follow them doesn't like to have uh, much democracy because it makes Turkey a uh, Turkey more uh, Turkey more independent. So. Uh, sometimes it resists, sometimes it accepts, but they have to uh, deal with Turkey as an equal partner rather than impose their decision. Russia, I mean, realized, Russia was the first to realize this, this uh, fact. I think now, like, like yesterday, France, uh, uh, France President Macron, he called also Erdogan. I think he also realized after intimidation and after uh, kind of escalation in discourse and in, in threats, I think he realized he has to deal with, uh, with Turkey and Erdogan in a more friendly way rather than threatening them and or uh, uh, intimidating them. So let me check the questions. In Yemen, it is a, it is a conflict, unfortunately, it's a proxy war Proxy for uh, for Iran because Iran is not uh, entering uh, uh, the war. It's a proxy for Iran, but it's a more direct war for Saudi Arabia because Iran is using Houthis as a proxy, but Saudis are 
fighting directly in it's, it's a mixed war but it is an unfortunate war it could have been prevented america even could have been prevented and what happened in yemen they thought they will uh, they will uh, make Houthis the, for the Saudis is the bad guy for Houthis. Also, Muslim Brotherhood, which is the Islam Party, again, uh, they're uh, bad guys. So they thought that if Houthis uh, take control and attack uh, Muslim Brotherhood there, it would be good for, uh, for Saudi Arabia. But they didn't know they were uh, drawn to the to the trap, to a trap in, in Yemen, because uh, when Muslim Brotherhood realized this uh, trap, they did not resist, they did not fight the Houthis. And uh, Saudi Arabia panicked because they realized that Iran now very uh, powerful in Syria and Iraq, and of course in the east and in the north. Now you have Iran in the south, which is a very critical point for Saudi Arabia. And Saudi Arabia pushed the panic button and uh, felt uh, to intervene to prevent this siege at least for, by Iran, but it was um, miscalculated. It depended on the military soldiers coming from Egypt and, and Pakistan. They did not come. They did not fight uh, for Saudi Arabia and it disrupted uh, and Mohammed bin Salman, as a young prince, he wasn't ready. He did not have any plan. Any plan to enter and win the war? Any plan to exit now? They don't even have the plan to how to exit the, the war. They, they all tired, especially Saudi Arabia. They want to exit. And we know our Biden era will bring more pressure to exit. But uh, they... They, are, they don't know what to do. And for Iran, it is less a problem because they are using proxy. I mean, more Yemenis dies. It's not a big thing for, uh, for, for Iran in Yemen conflict. So I know it's sensitive, but current uh, viewers in uh, the the situation uh, improved a lot for the Kurds in, in Turkey. It is, I mean, Turkey's problem is not like, uh, it's not an ethnic problem. We had a overall problem with the lack of uh, democracy, enough democracy. Now the democratic credentials, democratic uh, situation improved. Uh, there is a big improvement for everybody, for the Kurdish people, for economy, for freedom, Kurdish language. Uh, and sometimes it's mixed out, you know, they, uh, when uh, people suffer, everybody suffers. And uh, most of the Kurds now realize that. So this is the answer for the Eloa, the Santos Parado now. Uh, all countries, including Turkey, are as, are as well rationalist. They are just care about, of course, everybody has to care about cost and benefits. And Turkey is not uh, an oil country. They can spare billions of dollars for nothing. Uh, so they cannot. So it has to, also, when you are democratic, you cannot uh, play adventures, you know. Uh, you have to uh, give explanation to uh, to people, uh, to your people, because you are using their own money. Uh, Natawan Alieva also asked a question about Turkey-Iran relations. It's, it's an uh, important question, which is related to the Arab relations. Iran has a more uh, domineering attitude toward the Middle East because they have uh, both a uh, sectarian vision especially after the Iranian revolution. Before the revolution, they were, I mean, allies. They were working fine together. But after the revolution, Iranian revolution, even the revolution started as like a Muslim brotherhood to, to unite Muslim unity. Uh, but uh, slowly after the Iran-Iraq war, this Iranian perspective turned toward more nationalist and sectarian direction. So it changed uh, in the, right now about like 40 years, it changed a lot. 
And at the end, we have an Iran, which is very uh, assertive, maybe aggressive uh, toward the Middle East, which scares the Arabs. And I, I talked to them, yeah, I mean, I, I, one time I met with the uh, advisors of the foreign minister and some uh, uh, officials in Iran. I visited Iran uh, and I was the director, the founding director of the Center for Iranian Studies before or some center. And we told them, I said, yeah, I'm scaring the Arab, Arab, small Arab Gulf countries. It uh, does not serve their, their, your interest, I told them. I said, uh, uh, you, are, you are pushing them uh, toward America more or even Israel. He, they said, no, they are already Israeli puppets and stuff. But it was before Trump. But after, during the Trump period, we realized that can be, of course, worse, even worse than worse. So Trump and Kushner now came with the Iranian uh, threats and stuff. They, they, are, they became more Israeli allies and this normalization, et cetera. So Iran also uh, heard from this. I mean, uh, but uh, I don't think Iranians, I mean, there are some voices slowly understand that, but I don't think there is enough voice to, uh, to express common sense. And we hear sometimes from Iranians, uh, they say, uh, we can get along uh, in the region, we can have dialogue and stuff, but uh, you need to show it as, as an example because Iran is a big country. Some of the Arab countries in the region, the, its neighbors are not even a million. Iran is like 80 something million. So people are worried. I mean, the Iranians did not understand that. And me personally, I think Turkey also is for reconciliation and uh, calming down or uh, kind of uh, uh, get, uh, getting along in, in the region, dialogue between Turkey and Iran, Turkey and uh, Arabs and Arabs and Iran also. So they, we can, we can uh, live together, uh, but uh, these conflicts make it uh, more difficult. So, uh, but vis-a-vis -vis Turkey, Iran relations, it is, uh, it is friendship and competition. It is also maybe sometime hostility, but we can say competition is the main nature because uh, there are four countries, Muslim countries in the region that has potential for leadership, Egypt, Saudi Arabia, Iran, and Turkey. Egypt and Turkey are uh, majority Sunni countries. They have a big, big chunk and big history for leadership for the Muslim Muslim world, but Egypt is weakened after the coup, even was uh, weaker before, uh, and Egypt uh, cannot play this role uh, today. Uh, Egypt and Saudi Arabia also has a competition for the leadership of the Arab world. So this is another competition. Uh, when the coup happened, I said Saudi Arabia supports the military coup in Egypt because they want weaker Egypt. They don't want Egypt to be strong and to compete with them. And Iran is a Shia majority country and they have a different agenda, different kind of a minority psychology. They have historical Persian empire, um, you know, implications. They also don't uh, don't take uh, these countries very seriously. They say these are small countries are, uh, you know, we can influence them. Iran also using proxies in many Arab countries like in Hezbollah in Lebanon, Hashd al-Shaabi in Iraq, and uh, also uh, trying to control, uh, affect the policies in these countries through these proxies, which sometimes have arms, sometimes have political parties, sometimes have civil society institutions, and they have very effective uh, position. And of course, these Gulf countries have also Shia population. They are very much worried about these Iranian activities. They are like, uh, are they gonna rebel one time or are they gonna use Shia against these uh, governments? So they are very much worried. 
I mean, this uh, Turkey needs energy and buy some energy from Iran. Iran has a significant Azerbaijani people, Turkish people also speaking Turkish. We feel strongly with them and we don't also uh, feel hostility against Iranians, but the, re the regime is a little bit uh, now kind of uh, unnatural and uh, using uh, almost all tools, all uh, potential. I mean, Iranians are good in details, but when you st stretch out uh, general policy, let's say Syria policy, on the wrong basis, doesn't matter how good you are in, uh, in the small tactics, you know, the overall strategy, uh, even some now political leaders like Rafsanjani's wife and daughter, I think, and Ahmadinejad, you know, they criticize if, if the Syria war was not thwarted. But uh, after you, you enter a, in a wrong war, how, how good in small tactics doesn't matter as much. You know, they destroyed Syria. They also uh, destroyed their sympathy. I mean, it's going to take a long time for Iran, Iran to correct this image. So Turkey's relations with uh, Iran is normal. It, it doesn't reach to the conflict. I mean, we can see it's a competition for a regional role uh, and plus Turkey-Saudi relations also very significant. As I said, Saudis, uh, they, are, they were afraid of democracy. They supported the coup efforts in Egypt, in Yemen, in Libya. And they also even, they didn't want to help uh, democracy in, in Tunisia. But at the end, uh, Turkey, even though they are more a little bit hostile toward Turkey, they, Turkey did not adopt the same uh, attacking mode uh, uh, towards Saudi Arabia. Uh, slowly after the, of course, when the Trump and Kushner came, they give a big boost to Saudi, Saudi leadership. Of course, they got their money from Saudi Arabia. Uh, and uh, now people, after uh, Trump is out, uh, they begin, I think, to a uh, more normal relations, more acceptable relations with, uh, with Turkey, because Turkey is there. You cannot uh, ignore Turkey. I mean, uh, just like uh, Macron, he, he tried to intimidate Turkey and bully Turkey. And when you don't, uh, uh, you don't be afraid, they have to deal with you as a normal partner. I think Saudi Arabia also realized Turkey is needed uh, and is, a, is an important factor in, in the region. They, they, they have more problems with Iran so I think uh, even against Iran, they need to have normal relations with Turkey. There are some signs things may, especially after the normalization with Qatar, uh, I think Saudi Arabia will have better relations with Turkey also. So uh, that's almost. Uh, Saudi Arabia thought it is a, uh, Suraya, I mean, where is, where is she from? I want to know also if you can write. Uh, I mean, they claim to be the leader for Muslim uh, Muslim world, which is fine. I mean, everybody can uh, claim it, and it is uh, it is uh, it is everybody's desire. But uh, I mean, every role has expectations, you know. Uh, uh, you, if you are leader of, uh, if you want to apply the leadership, you have to be sensitive to Muslim, Muslim issues. You don't need to rush to normalize with Israel. You don't need to support, uh, you know, anti-Islamic uh, activities or things that hurt Muslims. Is not doesn't fit uh, to the leader of the Muslim world. So, Saudi Arabia, even when. Between the relations between Pakistan and and India, they like invest. They promise to invest in in India ten times, I think, more than Pakistan. So, how uh, does it fit to the leadership? You need to invest in if you are claiming the leadership. You you need to be strengthening the Muslim neighbors more than the, its its uh, adversaries.
I mean, it's their financial decision, but some of the signals that uh, Saudi Arabia gave and uh, normalization with Israel and uh, also supporting for the coups and weakening these conflicts uh, did not help Saudi Arabia to, to, to look like a leader of the Muslim world. So they are claiming they have Mecca and Medina al Haramain, yani al Sharifain. Uh, and uh, I mean, people also look at uh, actions, not for the claims. If they act accordingly, why not? Yani? Which is fine. I wish they act like a leader. Mm -hmm. ah, okay. That's all, uh, my friends, and we hope to see you uh, around. And uh, please follow us on Twitter and Facebook, whatever you are using. And we also hope to see you in other activities. Also, if you do master or PhD or something, you can consult me as a, I am also a professor at Istanbul University. I, I wish uh, you a successful uh, and happy, happy life. So we are uh, living in a global village, you know, we have friends all over the, all over the world. And uh, I think we, we wish you as a healthy future, but uh, the world is becoming smaller and uh, we, we can, I, I write into a, how do we, I write email. I don't know if everybody sees and I, when I type the answer. Ahmed Oysal, my name, at or some or this is my I, I have also Gmail, I am writing it here. So best luck and uh, hope to see you again. And uh, as I said, the world is small and you don't know where you meet as uh, another one. And uh, see you later. Ma'asalam. Görüşmek üzere. İyi günler.